This is not the Manchester United of old. This is not a club operating at the highest level. This is not a big club from the ownership model through to the chief executive sitting in a pub arguing with fans, through to the manager picking a group of players that are tactically all over the place because he hasn't set them up properly, through to a group of coaches that clearly don't give him any advice. Welcome to this week's edition of One to One with Simon Jordan. Of course, most importantly, keep liking and subscribing and keep leaving those questions in the comment section below. But away we go. Look, Man United get far too much airtime, far too much content delivery because they are Manchester United in the mind's eye. This is not the Manchester United of old. This is not a club operating at the highest level. This is not a big club from the ownership model through to the chief executive sitting in a pub arguing with fans through to the manager picking a group of players that are tactically all over the place because he hasn't set them up properly, through to a group of coaches that clearly don't give him any advice um, about how the team should be set up, through to, through to playing vertically challenged centre-halves that look like something from Fantasy Island, onto a group of players that simply don't seem to get what it is to, to work, work and play for Manchester United. You can't take very much besides sometimes in order for you to bounce you have to hit the bottom. I would suspect Manchester United have hit the bottom on um, Saturday against Brentford. You can't take anything away from Brentford, but there were £400 million pounds of players on that pitch from Manchester United. That doesn't include the players like Rashford and Eriksen and Ronaldo that have come on free transfers. So get the context, £100 million coming off the bench. It is early days of Ten Hag. He needs to get players in. He needs to get the culture right. He needs to get the setup right. And then we will see what Manchester United will produce this season. The tragedy is, is that United keep being given this focus because they are Manchester United, but realistically speaking, they are a very poor team in very poor order right now. Will they finish six? Probably, because ultimately they've got too many good players and too much opportunity to sign further ones, irrespective of the difficulties of signing Frankie de Jong, de Jong and whoever else they want to buy. I suspect United will get their boots on, but the column inches will get written and the manager will get derided and the Gary Nevilles of the world will parade around like some Trotskyist mentality of telling everyone how the capitalist owners are dreadful when really and truly and the players should be spared when it's the players that need to get themselves together. The owners can do much better, but so can the players. So going to the original genesis of the question, I suspect Man United will still be at the top of the table, not anywhere near the top but amongst the six or seven big clubs in the Premier League. And what that looks like at the end of the season, we'll see. And what Ten Hag does um, is get his head in the game, because I don't think it's there right now. I mean, look, you want passion. Conti and Tuchel having a spat because Tuchel's got the hump. Tuchel's got the hump, I call him Tuchel. Tuchel's got the hump because there's been two goals, goals scored that he doesn't like. Obviously, there's mass celebrations with Tottenham scoring in the last minute, so it's going to create an atmosphere in the stadium. I quite like it. I think it's like the dichotomy of discipline and then discipline, because you want discipline standards to be set by your managers, but you want passion and focus and absolute desire to win. And you saw a silly little push me, pull me. It was like watching Carl Froch and George Groves and the gloves are off, pulling one another around. I think the camera angle of Sky made it more dramatic. They should get an award for that. Um, but I quite like it because it shows a determination. I'd like to see people do that to Klopp because in the dugout we see Klopp bully people. So I like managers standing up. Spurs have got a live one in Conti. A lot in that game, Conti coming back to Chelsea, the manner in which the game went and the manner in which Tuchel went up the touchline celebrating goals, all brings out this atmosphere. They're both big boys. The, you know, I saw uh, Tuchel's comments before the game about not necessarily believing anything that comes out of Antonio Conti's mouth. So with that in mind, you can see the standards or scene was set. But as an owner looking down, I'd laugh at it. Um, I would have the juxtapose about discipline and indiscipline and wanting the players to have a standard. But I would also probably look at my manager if I'm entirely honest going, go on, son. No, um, I, I, you know, referees, poor referees. I wrote an article. Um, in, the, um, in the Observer years ago about refereeing standards demanding for a technological advance and suggesting that the game was jumpers for goalposts and cited a particular referee, Brian Kirsten, who I thought had been particularly poor, used him as an example, and the, and the FA tried to sanction me. Tried to, well, they did sanction me. They gave me a £10,000 fine, which I refused to pay. Um, I don't think 
there is a bias or agenda. I think there were good refereeing decisions and there were bad ones. And if you want to turn it into a bias, when you've got digital support mechanisms in place like VAR to add weights and measures, you've got to take this conspiracy theory all the way, way up to the third government on the grassy knoll. I just think decisions were made with vindication to some extent behind them. If you look at the goal that Spurs scored, which Richarlison was allegedly blocking the goalkeeper's view, if you look behind the television angle, you can see that the goalkeeper can clearly see it. The goalkeeper makes no protestation about people being in his way or, 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 or jumping up and down about the unfairness of that particular goal. Yeah, an argument about Cucurella, but look at the rules and look at the dynamics of those rules and say maybe the law's an ass. So no, I saw poor referees and you'd go, ugh, no, I haven't got David Ellery, have I? Um, or you'd look at the refereeing standards of the previous games and say, oh God, you know, not great with Uriah Rennie and his drivel. But I never sat there thinking, oh, it's an agenda against us. And I think that's a very weak, weak sentiment because often it's laid out that the big sides get all the outcomes, get all the results, especially when they're at home. So really, Chelsea fans, you played really well in the game. It wasn't a spectacle of beautiful football, but it was a spectacle of English football, probably at its best in certain respects. I thought Tottenham were the team going into the game with more momentum, but Chelsea, again, remind people of the fact that they were a very strong side with a very strong manager. So no, I'm not going to underpin, underscore, um, or even sort of validate the thinking that, that you've got biased referees. You know, it's very difficult for everybody to have stellar careers. I mean, what argument are we going to run for the, the non-career that Jose Mourinho had, or the lesser career that Rafa Benitez had, or the less career, lesser career that Arsene Wenger had? It's got nothing to do with the playing career that you had. That gives you sometimes an unfair advantage over those that perhaps haven't had the stellar playing careers, because people walking into jobs because of their playing career does those that are better coaches and have earned their badges and worked their way through the ranks a disservice. So I think that's a ridiculous argument. But to conflate it into the argument of Gerard and Lampard, well, Parker has got jobs. Um, he left Fulham, I think, because pretty much he wanted to leave Fulham because he fell out with the management structure there. Um, so no, I don't think he is judged unfairly by the Lampards and Gerrards of the world. Gerrard went up to Rangers, took three years to get them going, did an okay job, won the league that obviously stopped Celtic in their tracks, got the Villa job under more pressure. Flip side of the argument is that these big names players get more pressure quickly, that they get opportunities that come perhaps faster than they should do, like Chelsea taking Lampard probably too early in his career and subsequently become victims of their own reputation. So you can swing this both ways. But Scott Parker has got a job that some could argue that necessarily other people might have been more qualified to have gotten. Jonathan Woodgate lost his Bournemouth job. Jonathan Woodgate was a big player, and ultimately other people have come in and taken his job. Why? Is their name bigger? It, could you run that argument on both sides of, the, on both sides of the divide? So no, I don't think that's the case at all. Well, this, this boxing landscape is so fascinating. You've got Joshua Usyk uh, this week, which is a huge fight. You've got Joseph Parker, Joe Joyce. You've just seen Conor Ben announce against Chris Eubank. The landscape is fantastic. Um, Usyk Joshua is a fascinating fight because I don't know where Anthony Joshua goes if he loses this fight. He's used to fighting at the highest level. If he loses to Usyk, where does he go? He gets to fight domestic fights. He gets to fight fights that are lower on the food chain um, because he's done a deal with his own as an output deal that keeps him getting paid. So with that in mind, it makes me very curious. I've long said that I thought Anthony was a flat track bully and that the fighters that he fought, okay, he's won them, he's beaten them. Charles Martin was a paper champion. Uh, Vladimir Klitschko was, you know, old. And some of the other ones that he's fought and lost against, like Ruiz, who's a Pillsbury Doughboy, haven't helped me change that view. And of course, going into this Usyk first fight, it was incomprehensible that he decided to fight, arguably, one of the stylistically most advanced fighters and boxers and fight them in a way that suited them best for whatever reason Anthony decided to, which makes me think that he has to come out in this fight differently. You know, he is in last chance corral, uh, last chance saloon, sorry, of actually um, being taken seriously by certain factions of the boxing community. So with that in mind, I feel that there might be a twist. On paper, it's difficult to see why Usyk doesn't do precisely the same thing to Anthony Joshua. 
but perhaps if he hasn't fought the real Anthony Joshua, the one that can regain the poise that he had and the bravery and the sheer unadulterated destruction mentality that he had before he got knocked down against Vladimir Klitschko, not the one that negotiates fights past Joseph Parker, that negotiates retaining his belt in terms of keeping out of harm's way against Andy Ruiz, the one that goes in there and tries to knock people out, the one that uses his size and his combinations and the power and you know ferocity of his punches and is brave and goes in there. If that Anthony Joshua turns up, then there's a real chance we could see on paper what is now considered to be an upset, which is Joshua re regaining his belts. I hope he does because he's a British fighter. Despite my observations about him, I think he's done the boxing world a great service. He's lifted everything up because everybody's now in a different place because of the furore around Anthony Joshua. So I've got a sneaking feeling. I mean, Usyk coming in at 17 and a half stone, allegedly pumping up to be a bigger weight than Anthony Joshua is strange, but I'm sure he has his own thinking. And Anthony Joshua doing adverts where he's bursting out of the sea slightly worries me that his mind is not focused on the reality of the task. But I think there might be an upset. There's so much money in this sport, there's so much opportunities, and Anthony Joshua Express, you know, with the big wagon loads of money behind it, draws a lot of attention. So without me being cynical and suggesting there's any form of collusion or corruption, I think there's going to, there could be a strange outcome, and that strange outcome could be that Anthony Joshua surprises everybody and beats Usyk, but either which way, despite the fact this fight's in the Middle East, which I don't like, because I'd much rather see it being fought in the boxing capitals of the world rather than the money capitals of the world. And I know Las Vegas has always been about money as well, but it's got a history, and so has places in England. Despite all of that, what a fight, and what a week for boxing. Right, that's it for this week's edition of One to One with Simon Jordan. Don't forget to let me know your views on the obligatory subject of Manchester United, the battle between Tuchel and Conti, and of course, this massive fight of Anthony Joshua coming up at the end of the week. Keep leaving your questions in the comment section below, and of course, keep liking and subscribing. I'll see you next week.